the loudest feedback you ever can hear from a microphone. That was only going off in my head. My bottom lip. I'm wiping is away quivering because I'm blood so much out of my eyes because I can't see. And I had to have to get back up. Literally finish the match. Suck it up to be able to stand. In the 70s, New York wasn't the nicest place and I really never went in to New York. It started changing around the 80s and honestly, all I ever went to was Madison Square Garden. And uh, I, my dad took me all the time. Uh, he was a great man. He supported me and he was also, he was a sports fan. We would go to Mets games, Yankee games. Uh, I never felt unsafe no matter what was going on around me because I was with my dad. Or even back then, because I've realized this now, wrestling fans are the most dysfunctional family you can ever be a part of. And we are all at one because we all love wrestling. My first uh, memory of professional wrestling, my father was a seasoned uh, ticket holder for the New York Rangers. And when you're a kid, you like the teams that your dad likes. They were playing the Montreal Canadiens and the game was snowed out in, on television. And they showed wrestling from Madison Square Garden. The first person I saw coming to the ring was the WWF heavyweight champion, Bob Backlund. He was taking on a wrestler named Bulldog Brower from actually up here in Ontario. And he played like this wild character. And I remember going crazy because I did not understand what this was, but I was hooked to the television. My father was upstairs, and I was like, Dad, Dad, come down, Dad, Dad. He's like, oh, it's professional wrestling. And that moment was the hook. And then for my birthday, he took me to the White Plains Westchester County Center to see uh, wrestling live for the first time. And I got to see Bob Backlund defend his uh, heavyweight title against Bobby Duncan, and he won the match. Going to the ring, I remember him high-fiving me, and I remember turning to my friend, Larry, and I was just like, oh, felt I had a superpower. I also wrote a sign for Bob Backlund. Back then, there were not a lot of signs, and I wrote it on a loose leaf paper, and it said, Bob Backlund number one, and my uh, paper was too small, so I had to extend it with scotch tape, and Bob won his match with the Atomic Spine Crusher. He goes uh, past me again. I was like, Bob, can you sign this for me? So he said, uh, yeah, man, uh, wait for me. I go outside. It was February. For some reason, I did not want Bob Backlund to see me with my father. I don't know, I was a weird kid, I guess. And I didn't think Bob Backlund was, uh, think I was cool, because now we were tag team partners. And uh, so I stood in the sleet of February in New York for wait for Bob Backlund. Here comes Bob Backlund. I was like, hey, Bob. And it was me, three women, and two guys. And it was probably the most influential words of my life. I said, Bob, can you sign this for me? And he looked at me and said, I'll get you next time, kid. And I said, no, 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 Bob. Please, it's me, it's me, because I felt we had a bond together. And he went, take care, kid. On a skull and pulled up the car, got in the car, and drove off. I remember getting in the car, my father, and he knew I was upset. And as soon as I dropped off my friend, I started crying. And he was just like, what's wrong? I was like, you didn't give him his autograph. And I, and I was just heartbroken. And then uh, I hated Bob Backlund. And when I tell you I hated Bob Backlund, I hated Bob Backlund. I never wanted to see him win ever again. And I've always had a special bond with fans because I never forgot that moment of how he made me feel. And uh, years later, actually 30 years later, uh, I told Bob Backlund that story. And uh, four days later, he sent me an autographed picture of him holding the WWF title. And he said to my number one friend, Tommy Dreamer. And uh, so we made up 30 years later after that. I went to see Florida Championship Wrestling. In my defining moment where I knew I had to be a wrestler, there was a smoky arena. I remember mosquitoes in the mist of the people's cigarettes. And here came this blonde hair, 
was dusty roads, the American dream, dusty roads. And I, when I tell you I was frozen in my tracks and I watched him glide to the ring and I knew right then and there I saw God on earth. And I watched him and Bugsy McGraw take on Ivan Koloff and Dick Murdoch. And they came into the ring with a trash can and a broom handle. And I watched Dusty win. And I, when I tell you I was frozen, I could not move because I was so enthralled at what he was doing. And Dusty Rhodes made me believe. And right then and there, I knew what I had to do in my life. The wrestling business was still kept quiet. There was not, how do I become a wrestler? This, there's no internet. And in a newspaper article, it was for all you tough guys, wannabe pro wrestlers, come for a movie audition for Captain Lou Albano. They handed me a microphone and I cut my best pro wrestler, Hulk Hogan wannabe promo. And uh, I remember looking around, there was Rocky Johnson and I walked up to Rocky Johnson, who was sleeping on the ring apron. And I walked up to him and said, excuse me, I'm Mr. Johnson, I'm a huge fan. I really want to be a professional wrestler. Uh, do you have any advice for me? He looked at me and said, uh, go talk to that guy. And then that was Johnny Rods. I went over there and said, excuse me, Mr. Rods, uh, I was Rocky Johnson sent me over here. I want to be a professional wrestler. He looked me up and down and said, hey, kid, here's my card. Uh, come and uh, meet me at Gleason's gym. And then the very next week, that's what I did. My first match was October 28th, 1989. Johnny Rods had uh, booked me on the show. I was training only about four months. It was the greatest accomplishment I ever, at that time, could have done. I had 50 of my own friends there and family. And then my second match was December 2nd, that same year and uh, I had a hundred of my friends and family there. So I was well on my way in my head to uh, making it to the WWE. Just thinking about that, man, my grandfather was there, my whole family was there, and uh, they got to see their son make it. And uh, nobody was sick, nobody, everyone was still alive, and they all came together. It was a cool moment for me. I wish they all were around, but, you know, that's the hard part about life. But I have all those matches. I can't watch them because I start doing this. But, uh, again, a great family night. I've watched the, the tape before, and uh, it's hard. My dad is dead, <clears throat> but uh, my aunt is dead. My aunt, uh, I wrestled Bill DeMott, and uh, my aunt said... You better watch who you deal with. I'm gonna put a hit on you, mother And uh, he still to this day would be like, is your aunt still mad at me? And uh, you know, my grandfather hit the ring and I had a, like I was getting beat down. And I had to turn to my grandfather who was a borderline gangster. And uh, I was like, grandpa, no, like you're gonna ruin the show. But it was just, again, why I say we're a dysfunctional family because my family was crazy. And I had a hundred of them there, and we're surrounded by maybe three, four hundred other crazy wrestling fans. That's cool. My bottom lip is quivering because I'm in so much pain, and I had to literally suck it up. I worked a lot of indies for about two years. Taz and I were traveling partners. We were best friends. And uh, we had this match. We would wrestle everywhere. There was a promoter, Tony Rumble. He used us all the time. Because we were doing things back then that a lot of people weren't doing. Taz had all these suplexes. I was a handsome, mullet-happening, 1990s prototypical jacked up Guido baby face. And that's what I thought I had to be to make it in the wrestling business. Taz was scheduled to go to ECW. Uh, Paul Heyman had liked Taz's work. Paul had actually gotten him a tryout with WCW. And then uh, I just showed up with Taz because I drove him everywhere. Paul put me to work in my first match against Taz at uh, 
the first ever show that he took uh, over. And that's how I got hooked in ECW and I had a job ever since. In ECW, it was Philadelphia, you know, they, they catch a bad rap, but man, not for me, because, you know, I always say Tom Lachlan was born in Yonkers, New York, but uh, Tommy Dreamer was born in Philadelphia. I wrestled Taz. Three days later, Paul Heyman calls me up. He's like, can you come to the studio? So I come to the studio. I drive two and a half hours. He lets me watch my match again. It's like, cool. And then he goes, no, watch this. There was four people who gave me a standing ovation and they were just clapping. I lost to Taz. He goes, I can do something with you. These people believe in you. It was only four people. I was like, cool, man. You know, here's this crazy Paulie. I don't really know you. That entire ECW show was based upon all the bad guys. Evil was taking over ECW. Shane Douglas, the public enemy, all this stuff. And Joey Styles was recapping the entire show. And then he went, wait, 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 let's go back. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, Philadelphia, these people are giving Tommy Dreamer a standing ovation. This hardcore bloodthirsty town is giving this pretty boy a standing ovation. Maybe there's hope for ECW after all. And the show went off the air. Paul did a lot of things to help help me try to you know get over. It was Taz who went to Paul and said, hey man, this kid is tough. Trust me, I dump him on his head and he just keeps on getting back up. And that's where we came up with the Sandman caning angle. An American citizen was gonna get caned for real in Singapore and it got national attention. So Paul decided to do loser of a match gets caned 10 times. And I lost the match, Sandman caned me. And the first couple of hits, the fans were cheering. And I was really getting caned in the middle of a ring. By like three or four, they were like, stay down, Tommy. About, about five and six, I watched the crowd turn. It hurt, you saw the welts on my back, you saw my body, my back bleeding, my arms bleeding. By like, eight and nine people, there was people crying in the audience and they hated Sandman and they were cheering for me. And that was pretty much one of my beginning defining moments of being accepted by the fans for being tough. With the Singapore cane, if, if you look, it's real bamboo. When it hits you, it hurts. It always marks you up. Nowadays, we've learned that if you cut some of the wires and cut the white part, it will bend more for more resistance. But every time it hits you, the bamboo closes and cuts you. That's kind of the, the real tool for it. If you go back and look at what we did, every band was pulled tight. There was nothing fake about that cane. And I really got caned. Now, to talk about the pain, I knew I had to get 10 lashes. And I knew I had to keep getting up. There's one point I had serious doubts that I physically could, and I'm laying against the rope, I'm, tr I'm sitting down, trying to pull myself up, my bottom lip is quivering because I'm in so much pain, and I had to literally suck it up to be able to stand just to take like another four or five. And if you go back and watch it, it is, it's brutal. It should have a parental uh, discretion to watch, but you can hear the audience change. And for me, the performer, I knew I had to finish this performance. And then what I didn't know when it was all said and done, he also, I turned around, he clipped me in the back of the head, which bent around and hit me in the front because he broke the cane so much uh, with, the, with that torque. It hit me twice. And then he hit me again when I was on the floor and I literally said, dude, that's enough. I couldn't take anymore. So it probably took about 12, maybe 13. And then in true professional wrestling, I come to the back and me and him hug and we embrace because we knew we just did something special. And, and I didn't know Sandman too, too well back then. And to his credit, the follow-up with all that stuff, we did a thing where I blinded the Sandman and he couldn't see and we were going, to, he was gonna retire. He stayed home blind for, I wanna say 40 days 
And when he went out, he wore bandages over his eyes. He wore sunglasses everywhere he went out. So local people were like, oh, wait, Sandman's really hurt. Sandman's really retiring. And I remember that crowd, how he duped everybody. But that's what we had to do back then to get that stuff over. And that's a testament to him. He took his kids to school being blind with his wife driving and you know walking his, in his real life. That's what he did to sell a wrestling angle. And it worked for him and it worked for me. It is beyond theater. It is beyond taking it to the next level. Old wrestlers too used to take sandpaper and sandpaper their own faces to show they got beat up in a parking lot. Think about that. They would sandpaper their own foreheads and faces to sell an angle. It's their whole other level of crazy and tough. When uh, Raven came into ECW, uh, Paul did not trust him. Paul uh, just said he was one of Vince's uh, lackeys. When uh, Raven came into ECW, uh, Paul did not trust him. Paul uh, just said he was one of Vince's uh, lackeys. And uh, he was there just to be for me for three months, which turned into three years. And he became Paul's favorite character in ECW. The first night, most people don't realize this, on a, on a show in Baltimore, I actually pinned Raven. And Paul kept that footage just in case because he didn't trust Raven. Uh, just in case Raven ever pulled anything. I didn't know Raven whatsoever. And when you talk about two people who are opposite ends of a spectrum, he was Darth Vader, I was Luke Skywalker. We came up with this storyline that a lot of people still talk about, where the two of us grew up together. He was from New Jersey, I was from New York. We went to summer camp together, and he was the weirdo kid. I was the popular kid, but I befriended him, and then he came back to extract his revenge. He also had a fat girl who used to like the handsome Tommy Dreamer and uh, she came back as a penthouse pet who was Beulah McGillicuddy. The Sandman angle started to get me over with the people. Raven solidified it. Without Raven, there would have been no Tommy Dreamer. Without Tommy Dreamer, there would have been no Raven. I've never gelled better with another person in the ring at that time. And my favorite part of all of that was all the characters that spawned from him. And Tommy Dreamer's feud was Eula, Stevie Richards, the BWO, Blue Mean, Nova, Francine, the Pitbulls, Brian Lee, the Bruise Brothers, so many different people spawned from that feud and they went on to have a career as well. It was just, it was storytelling, it was episodic television that could never be repeated because it was just, I lost to a guy for three years and they still cheered for me to see me win. Unheard of. My feud with Raven, kind of put me over the top with being accepted. And there was a famous shot of me standing in the crowd, hitting my pose, covered in blood. And uh, I remember after that match happening, and I did that, because I went over the guardrail and I, and I hit my pose and then we were chanting ECW, ECW. Paulie showed that every week. It was on the opening of the show. I remember coming back through that curtain. First person there was Paul with a hug, and a hug like a father to a son. And he was just looked, and he's like, you did it. You made it, you're over. And he was just embracing me because I was kind of like his project. And he was just, once this happens for you, you will never, ever not be over as long as you don't let those people down. But there was a lot of things that Paul Heyman taught me to do differently to try to get people to like me in the sense of little, little, like, he goes, when you walk out through a curtain, because you ever watch Arn Anderson? Arn Anderson, as a bad guy, people are clamoring to hate him. And he looks to the left, he looks to the right, he does this, he keeps on walking. And if he looks, those people back up. When Arn Anderson was a good guy, he would still walk out and do the same thing. Look to the left, look to the right, and those same people that want to kill him Arn, Arn, we love you. He said, I want you to do that. 
And then it was Terry Funk who told me, I know you're trying hard, just be yourself. Just be Tommy and the audience will get you. And then he also told me to grow a goatee because it'll make me look tougher because I have a baby face. And then he also said when I become his age, it'll hide my double chin. So he was right uh, 20 years ago and today. He's like uh, Nostradamus, that Terry Funk. In uh, ECW, it was at first a struggle and then, but you could actually see your hard work paying off because you saw the attendances grow. The biggest way to make the most amount of money was pay-per-view. And it was our, we're so close to trying to get our lottery ticket and it was at a ECW Barely Legal. And I remember one of the hardest parts for me, I did not wrestle on ECW's first ever pay-per-view. And I remember when Paul had to come and tell me that. And he said, you're gonna give up your spot at our first ever pay-per-view for Terry Funk. And I thought about it, because I was mad at first, but once I thought about it and he told me about the story, he's like, you're sacrificing the biggest show for someone else. That's what Tommy Dreamer would do. And I said, you're right. And Terry Funk won that title. I helped him win that title. If you watch that footage where Terry Funk's bleeding and he's walking around and everyone is just hugging because we all felt like we made it together. My role in ECW, Paul Heyman gave me a great opportunity where he took a 23 year old kid and not only was helping him learn professional wrestling and being on television, he also allowed me to do a lot of stuff behind the scenes. If this was WWE, I was talent relations I was merchandise, and I was creative with Paul. But then, I mean, I remember one of my crowning moments where he was just like, you know what, you just you booked half the show, you just run the show, and I ran a pay-per-view. I was hurt, and I ran Anarchy Rules, where Jerry Lynn won the title in his hometown. Paul didn't even put the headset on. He just sat back and watched the show. For him to entrust me, we had that, because he knew at the end of the day, I was always about what was great for ECW. There was something for everyone. If you wanted booze, you can have booze. If you want to just come there and take a picture, you can take a picture. If you wanted to smoke pot with somebody, you could smoke pot with Rob Van Dam. If you want to drink a beer with the same man, you can drink a beer with the same man. If you want to go do drugs with wrestlers, you can do drugs. If you want to have sex with wrestlers, you could have sex with wrestlers. It was the best time ever. And that was what I got to live for eight years.